Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Helene Davis, and I am the president of the Rotary Club of Cupertino. Welcome to the annual State of the City Address, hosted by the Rotary Club of Cupertino, the Cupertino Chamber of Commerce, and the City of Cupertino. I would like to invite Tom Pike, who is the District Director for Congressman Ro Khanna, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Please rise if you are able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. On behalf of the board, the cabinet, and the members of the Rotary Club of Cupertino, it is my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here today. The mission of Rotary International is to provide service to others promote integrity, and advance world understanding, goodwill, and peace through our fellowship of business, professional, and community leaders. We have a very active and vibrant club here in Cupertino. We have over 200 members, uh, business, professional, and community leaders. We raised and distributed over $261,000 worldwide last year. We, thank you. We champion 60 local service projects and 10 global grant ser service projects worldwide around the world. And we are very proud that our membership reflects the diversity in our community. I would like to recognize the Cupertino Rotary uh, Board of Directors and our cabinet. They're a very hardworking and talented group of community volunteers. Here is our Board of Directors for 2018 and 19. And we do our charitable uh, work through our four avenues of service, community service, international service, vocational service or workforce development, which is a new uh, term that they're moving towards, and youth service. It also takes several other committees to um, keep our, our club thriving and vibrant. So if you are a member of the Cupertino Rotary Board of Directors or the Cabinet, could you please rise so that you can be acknowledged? And please join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you for all you do to make our community a better place. So Rotarians are people of action. We volunteer and partner with our city, with our schools, and with our community nonprofits to help make a difference in our community. As an organization, we volunteered over 12,000 total hours last year. And as I said, we do most of our charitable work through our four avenues of service. So community service, we focus on hands-on projects that build club spirit and connect us directly with those in need. We do this by serving our seniors, by cooking dinners at JW House, which is a home away from home for families that are facing medical crises. We volunteer twice a year with Rebuilding Together. Uh, we fix up uh, the home of an either elderly or disabled individual. We do this by carving pumpkins with our seniors and our youth. We work in the kitchen at our daily bread and we deliver Thanksgiving dinners. And through our youth services programs, we build confidence, self-esteem, and leadership, and help connect our Rotarians and youth of our community. We do this by sponsoring a troop and supporting scouting, by reading on Dr. Seuss's birthday and donating books, by creating a winter wonderland for a, a adult and child uh, disabled individuals 
with Via West Services, and we do that with Operation Snowflake. We hold both a speech and a poetry reading contest. We provide scholarships for Tech Trek through A AUW. We shop for back to school supplies through West Valley Community Services. And there's our high school speech contest winners this year. Through our vocational service and our workforce development, our members share skills and expertise with individuals in our community to promote success in their work or in their career. We do this by providing scholarships for students seeking AA degrees or bachelor's degrees. We provide mini grants for teachers at CUSD and FUHSD. We give out a vocational service award each year to an individual who has used their vocation to help others. And we are piloting a summer internship program through Fremont Union High School District. Through our international services, we partner with nonprofit organizations to provide grants that help those in need around the globe. This year, we championed projects in Puerto Rico, in Romania, uh, and in rural China. And these are just a few of the many, many projects that our Cupertino Rotarians are involved in every year. So if you are interested in joining leaders of our community or supporting some of our local service projects, please come and see me after the meeting or you can talk to any of our Rotarians here in the audience. So thank you very much for listening to a little bit about Cupertino Rotary. We are very proud of our club and of our organization. Uh, and now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the 2019 president of the board of the Chamber of Commerce, Let's give a warm welcome to Rod Deardon. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Helene. And on behalf of the Cupertino Chamber of Commerce, in partnership with the Rotary Club, thank you to everyone here today. Uh, let me first figure out how to use the clicker. There we go. Uh, first, let me say that in any community, the good work that's done by the Chamber of Commerce is done by primarily volunteers on their board of directors, their executive board, uh, and their, their regular board. In addition to, in Cupertino, some very, very hardworking staff. I'd like to acknowledge who these folks are up on the screen, ask them all to stand and be recognized. Please, if you're on the board, the e-board, or one of our chamber staff members, please stand to be recognized. The mission of the chamber is to work with government, education, and provide and private industry to assist and strengthen local businesses, to be an advocate for vibrant, sustainable, and healthy community and economy. These are just a few of the member companies that we have represented here in the city of Cupertino in the Cupertino Chamber of Commerce. Uh, if you are a representative or affiliated with one of these companies, let me thank you for all that you do to help create a sustainable, vibrant economy in the city of Cupertino. Let me share with you that our chamber priorities this year are fairly simple. To support local businesses, to identify transportation solutions, and to foster sustainable and healthy communities. Let me share with you just a few of the events that are coming up in the, uh, this year with Cupertino, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. It's gonna be a busy year. February 2nd, we have our Cupertino Education Fair. On February 8th, we'll celebrate the Lunar New Year Festival. On February 27th, there will be a Get Your Business Online uh, seminar being held. April 7th will be the Holy Festival. The Star Awards, of course, are gonna be April 26th. July 20th will be the night at the market, and that's uh, the first time that we're doing this event in partnership with De Anza College. Thank you very much for that partnership, and we we'll look forward to having a fantastic kickoff. Uh, there's the Food and Wine Stroll on August 29th, and the Diwali Festival on October 12th. Uh, for more information with regards to Cupertino, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and the events, you can go to that website and find more information there. The Star Awards 
recognize the fantastic, vibrant community that we have in Cupertino. And this is a fantastic place to live, work, or play. It is that way because of the people who live here, because of the people who volunteer in the community, because of our community leaders, members of the Chamber of Commerce Board, the Rotary Board that we've talked about here today, our elected officials that are present, but also just rank and file folks who day after day do great things for our community and have vibrant, fantastic businesses that we all enjoy. Let me help, uh, let me take the time today to acknowledge and announce who those star award recipients will be. The uh, business of the year will be Paul and Eddie's Monte Vista Inn. And if you're affiliated with Paul and Eddie's, first, thank you. Um, next, if you could stand and uh, remain standing so we can acknowledge you all uh, once we've identified all of the award winners. I'll go back one. Oh. Uh, next, the organization of the year is the Toyokawa Sister Cities Association. The Citizens of the Year for 2019 are Don Sun, and Henry Sang. And the President's Award will be provided to John Zarelli. Thank you very much. We appreciate your hard work on behalf of the city of Cupertino. And please be seated. We hope to see you all at the Star Award banquet on April 26th. And with that, let me take some time to acknowledge our visiting dignitaries. <clears throat> uh, from Congressman Ro Khanna's office, Tom Pike. And this is a long list, so let's practice the one clap rule. <laughs> one, two, three. All right. Very good. Uh, from Senator Jim Bell's office, Yvonne Chow. From Assemblyman Evan Lowe's office, Patrick Ahrens. From Assemblymember Mark Berman's office, Zach Ross. Uh, we are honored to have with us Santa Clara County Supervisor Joe Simidian and County Supervisor Dave Cortese. Uh, from Santa Clara County, we have the Assistant Sheriff Ken Binder, Assistant Sheriff Michael Doty, Assistant Sheriff Eric Taylor, and Captain Rich Urena. From Santa Clara County, we also have Fire Chief Tony Bowden, Assistant Chief John Justice, and Deputy Chief Brian Glass. From the city of Super, uh, Cupertino, who we will hear from later today, uh, of course, we have Mayor Stephen Scharf. We have uh, Council Member Rod Sinks, Darcy Paul, John Willey, and uh, Interim City Manager Tim Borden. From, uh, we also have a number of former mayors and council members here. Uh, Jim Jackson, Sandra James, Richard Lowenthal, Orrin Mahoney, and Gilbert Wong. From the Board of Trustees from the Cupertino Union School District, uh, we have uh, the Board President, Phyllis Vogel, the Vice President, Lori Cunningham, and then Board Members, Jerry Lynn, uh, Satish Muthatil, uh, and Superintendent Craig Baker. And then from the Fremont Union High School District, we have Board President, Roy Rocklin, uh, uh, Vice President Jeff Mo, Board Members Rosa Kim, Naomi Nakano Matsumoto, Bill Wilson, and Superintendent Polly Bovey. From the Foothill De Anza Community College District, we have uh, Member Patrick Ahrens. Go Spartans. Thank you. <laughs> and Board Member Gilbert Wong. From the uh, Cupertino Sanitary District, we had board member Angela Chen. Is there anyone who is a visiting dignitary who we have not recognized? Oh, Patrick Kwok, 
Very good to see you, Patrick. Thank you for your service. Could everybody who I've just recognized please stand once and allow us all to recognize you together. Alina, I think this is when you come and join. Each year that this, let me see. Uh, each year we take the time during this event to recognize our public safety officers who have made a significant difference in the city of Cupertino. We all know that on a day-to-day -day basis they put themselves in harm way, harm's way for our benefit. We appreciate that. We appreciate the toll that it takes on them and their families. And we appreciate their ongoing community service. I'd like to call up County Fire Chief Tony Bowden who will introduce the first recipient. Mr. Bowden. Good afternoon, I'm Tony Bowden, Fire Chief, Santa Clara County Fire Department. And today, the firefighter that we're gonna be recognizing is firefighter Angela Graham. So Angela, if you can come up. So Angela works in our operations division, and appropriately so, I'm gonna have our operations deputy chief, Brian Glass, say a few words about Angela. Uh, good afternoon. As Chief Bowden stated, my name is Brian Glass, Deputy Chief of Operations, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to be able to present uh, and talk a little bit about Firefighter Angela Graham. First off, I'd like to say thank you very much to Mayor Stephen Scharf, members of the Council, Cupertino Rotary, Cupertino City staff, and the Chamber. Uh, Angela Graham joined the Santa Clara County Fire Department on December 7, 2006 as a firefighter engineer. Firefighter Graham has spent over 10 years as a member of County Fire Special Operations Task Force stationed at the Seven, String Seven Springs Fire Station right here in Cupertino. She's also a member of the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA's Urban Search and Rescue California Task Force 3. And what that means is they're a group of highly trained, highly skilled individuals that deploy internationally uh, throughout the world to hurricanes and large-scale disasters. Just in 2018 alone, Angela deployed with her team to Hurricane Irma in southwest Florida, Hurricane Lane in Hawaii, and most recently assisted with the recovery efforts at the devastating campfire in Butte County. Firefighter Graham is a CSTI, California Specialized Training Institute instructor with a primary focus in hazardous materials and has been the lead instructor at our most recent County Fire Recruit Academy. On a personal note, Firefighter Graham was a former softball player at the University of Texas where she earned a full ride scholarship as a pitcher. I would be remiss if I did not mention that she is also a devoted mother to her son, Alexander, who's two and a half. Firefighter Graham continues to serve as a dynamic follower She's a team member and an excellent leader in response to the operational needs within our organization. Her dedication, commitment, and leadership ability are inspirational as she proudly serves the department and the citizens of Cupertino. I'm proud to recognize Firefighter Angela Graham. Okay, I think it's my turn. So I would like to call up Sheriff Captain Rich Arena, who will introduce our second recipient. Good afternoon, on behalf of Sheriff Smith, who unfortunately was unable to join us today, and the men and women of the Sheriff's Office, we want to thank the Chamber, the Rotary, and the City of Cupertino for allowing us to be here today and recognize one of our staff members. Uh, truth be told, we could probably fill this room here full of our staff members that do a good job here in the City of Cupertino and in the County of Santa Clara, but we had to choose one. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our Deputy uh, Travis Welch, who's here to my left. Deputy Welch started his law enforcement career with the Sheriff's Office in 2002. After completing his patrol training, he was assigned to Cupertino as he had previously graduated from Lindbrook High School and lived in the area. He spent his first year working day shift in Cupertino alongside motorcycle deputies 
who have a primary duty of enforcing our traffic laws. After seeing how great it was to ride a motorcycle while getting a nice suntan and getting paid, <laughs> he decided to apply the next time around. Deputy Welch was accepted into the traffic unit in 2006. From 2006 to 2011, he worked in the traffic unit as a motorcycle deputy assigned to the city of Cupertino. During those five years as a deputy on a motorcycle, he worked, the various, he worked with various schools and communities in order to mitigate traffic problems and find solutions, and something we continuously do day in and day out. As a side note, he has issued the most traffic citations <laughs> each, I know, right, mixed messenger, each year for the entire sheriff's office. This gentleman here. Right? <laughs> In 2011, he was transferred to the Detective Bureau and was assigned to Cupertino as a, as a property crimes detective. He spent the next three years solving burglaries, financial crimes, and property crimes that occurred in the city of Cupertino. He joined our crime scene investigation team while he was assigned as a detective. Uh, as a member of the CSI team, he responded to major crimes involving homicides, robberies in the city and county. He returned back to the traffic unit in 2014, again as a motorcycle traffic deputy. He's currently assigned there and enjoying every day on his motorcycle. <laughs> as an example of his work, in 2018, Deputy Welch issued over 850 moving citations and investigated 46 traffic collisions. So let me, let me do the math here. 850 citations a year for 10 years. 8,500 8, citations in the, la in the 10 years he's been assigned to Cupertino. Or the way that I, look at, I like to look at that, 8,500 unsafe drivers, right? In the city of Cupertino. You can often see Deputy Welch working near Cupertino schools trying to keep vehicles and pedestrians safe both in the morning and afternoon. Yes, thank you. And you really can't miss his motorcycle. It's nice, clean, and bright white. Hint. Currently, as a collateral duty, Deputy Welch is part of the Sheriff's Office off-road enforcement team. This is a team that's utilized during special events for fire evacuations and as well as searching for missing persons in rural parts of our county. Deputy Welch is also a vital member of our Sheriff's Traffic Accident Reconstruction Team, also known as our STARS team. They investigate major injuries and fatal traffic collisions in Cupertino as well as the other cities that we provide services for. Lastly, he is a certified police motorcycle instructor. In fact, we have two new deputies that he's gonna be training here in the next couple of months. So as you can see, Deputy Welch has given the city of Cupertino over 10 years of distinguished service. His daily efforts do not go unnoticed, as I have received several compliments on his performance. As a dedicated traffic enforcement officer, I have no doubt that, he's, that his efforts have saved many lives, as we know distracted driving is a contributing factor to many collisions. For all his hard work and efforts in keeping Cupertino motorists and pedestrians safe, the Sheriff's Office would like to recognize Deputy Travis Welch as the City of Cupertino's 2018 Public Safety Officer of the Year. It is our pleasure to host Mayor Stephen Scharf. Uh, Steve was elected to the Cupertino City Council first in November of 2016. He advocates for schools, affordable housing, sensible growth, smart cities, transportation, open space, and the environment. He has a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering from the University of Florida and has worked at numerous technology companies in the area, including GTE, Xerox, Timeshare, National Semiconductor, and Kratos Technologies. He is married to Karen Chin and has two children. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Mayor Stephen Scharf. So I was really pleased to see Paul and Eddie's get that award because when I worked at Timeshare in the 1980s, I was looking for someone and I said, where's Sid? I can't find him. And they said, oh, he's over in Building P. 
And I looked at the map, I said, there is no building P here. I said, oh, that's Paul and Eddie's. That's where he always is at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> so yeah, that was my first introduction to uh, building P in Paul and Eddie's. And I've not spent a lot, spent a lot of time there, but we, we do go there occasionally. I think that's probably about the last bar in Cupertino. So thank you everyone from, for coming. And I call this presentation Death by PowerPoint. <laughs> so the first 200 slides I'll do tonight, I mean this morning, and then the next 200 you have to come this afternoon and, and, and we'll get those going. So here's my first proposal. As you know, our president would like to build a wall around um, between Mexico and the United States and get Mexico to pay for it. Well, this is my wall around Cupertino and no one here is from San Jose, are they? So San, San Jose is gonna pay for it, I guarantee it. <laughs> so let's move to traffic. First of all, 850 a year, maybe we could do 850 per day because I can see that just around the schools. And yesterday, I got an email on actually on Monday from a student at Kennedy Middle School who was complaining he can't ride his bike to school because the cars are creating two traffic lanes on the road, Hannesport into Kennedy. And I have, let's see, this It's changing on my screen, but not on that screen. Ah, okay, there we go. Okay, so the student emailed me and I went out there yesterday morning and took a bunch of pictures. And it's true, the cyclists can't ride to school. The cars are creating a second traffic lane. They're stuck on the sidewalk. He said his parents won't let him to ride, ride to school. It's too dangerous. The left picture, you see someone jumping out in the middle of the street. You don't see the cyclist who was coming down and could have been doored or hit by them. So I'd love some more traffic enforcement around our schools. And let's get that 860 up to 8,600 as soon as we can. <laughs> and I've seen this since I moved to Cupertino, the bad behavior around schools the serial red light running, the blocking of intersections, which uh, one gentleman here today, Dennis Whitaker, experienced yesterday, and the parking and bicycle lanes, and the crosswalk violations. When my kids were small, I had a stop sign that I would use when I walked them to school, which really embarrassed them. But it did get the cars to stop when we crossed the street. Well, let's move on, the general plan. Um, one issue with our general plan is it needs to be cleaned up. What we need, we need objective standards for every parcel in the city so we don't fall into the trap of having state laws dictate to us what we're allowed to build and not build in certain areas. And this is really important because there's a lot of harmful state legislation coming down the pike that we have to be ready for. And housing, that's always been a big issue here. I want to show this slide here. This is what the Apple campus would look like if all 13,000 eventual workers would be housed right on site. So we would have to build that much high-rise housing, and obviously that's not going to happen. And we wonder what happened to the housing we entitled. I wasn't on the council in 2015. We had our RENA allocation, scenario A, scenario B. There were 1,400 units that developers asked for that were entitled. And how many of them are under construction? There's actually 19. It's the veranda on Stevens Creek Boulevard. All the other arena allocations have not been built yet. Some of them, the plans have been approved but not permitted. They've never asked for permits. Some are not even that far along. So we're also, we're criticized by the state often. Where is the housing? It's like, well, we allocated arena numbers. We met them, but how do we get the people that took those allocations to actually build? So this is one example. Uh, the developer got 600 additional units. They really wanted 750. Uh, but now they're concerned. The economy's slowing. Should they tear down the existing project and lose the rent for those 342 existing units for a couple of years while the other ones are being built? Um, the construction costs are enormously high. And they have to pay community benefits of $7 million to build um, some buildings or a building at the Civic Center. So that's on hold and has a 10-year entitlement. 
So it could be a long time, if ever, be before we get that money for the community benefits. And then this has been a big issue where, with, um, where we really can do better. The parents of, of developmentally disabled adults have come to multiple council meetings. They've been asking for extremely low income ELI housing units uh, for their adult children because when the parents are gone, they worry what is going to happen to their children. And this is an example of a building that was built in Minneapolis, St. Paul that was funded by the Jewish Housing and Programming Group, but it's open to everyone of all faiths. Now, I think we're in one of the richest areas in the world here. Certainly we can find a way somehow where we can provide this needed housing. I'm sure we all have family or friends that are in this situation. We really have to find a way to do this. Now on to CASA. Who here has heard of CASA? So they call it the Committee to House the Bay Area. I kind of call it the Committee to Destroy the Bay Area. And what is the compact? It's 10 elements to drive state legislation on housing. And if you look at the funding, part of it comes from taking property tax away from cities, 20% of any additional property tax. It will limit mitigation fees. It will impose zoning changes on cities. There is nothing in the compact regarding transportation, zero. And transportation is an integral part of solving the housing situation. If we can't move workers from places with lots of land for housing to places with lots of jobs, we just can never solve this housing issue. But cost is really not the right answer. It's going to cause displacement, gentrification, and there was just a study from MIT that I read today that says the more high density housing you build, the higher the cost of housing becomes because you've made the land so valuable. So the CASA Compact was crafted by, there's 101 cities in the Bay Area. It was crafted by four cities, San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland, and for some reason, Rohnert Park. The other 97 cities were completely left out of the process. Once it was done, they could say, we like this or don't like this, but they had no say in the creation of the CASA Compact. And the numbers are just astounding, and the imbalance it creates is astounding. If you, do, if you look at the funding they propose, $4 million from corporations, and divide it by the dollars per square foot, they would be building 40 million square feet of office per year, which would be 200,000 more workers per year if you use 200 square feet per worker and they only proposed 35,000 housing units per year, and you would need 133,000 to house all those workers. So if this element actually went through as proposed, we would be adding a deficit of 98,000 housing units per year to the Bay Area, which is not gonna help the housing situation. It's gonna make it greatly, greatly worse. Now something we all love, our library, and on the right is a picture of our, libra our librarian, Claire, can she stand up? Thank you, Claire. So last year I was on the Santa Clara Valley Library Commission, which was one of the best commissions to ever go to. Nobody fights, nobody argues. It's a happy meeting. They've got a lot of funding. They're trying to figure out how to spend it. I just wish every commission could be like that. But we do have challenges in our library. We don't have a program room, unlike most of the libraries in the county. Parking has always been a big problem in our library. Uh, I'm not sure what the solution to that is, and the library is very overcrowded as well. It's, I, I thought it was a protest when I was outside at 9.45 a.m., and there's this big group of people standing out there. I go, what, why are they here? No, they're waiting to go into the library. It's, it's standing room only. So how can we fix this situation? Well, the city is going to have to find a way to come up with the money to fund the program room because the money that was supposed to come in community benefits is going to be a long time coming. We, we really can't wait for that. And long term, if we build the new city hall, because our city hall right now will either need to be retrofitted or a new building built, I think we should try to include the council chambers in the new city hall and give the 
community hall back to the library where, subject to who you believe, it was actually supposed to be mainly used for library functions. Now parking, one thing, we're getting more money from the county we can use to increase the hours. Hopefully that will spread out the use of the library so there will be less cars there at any one time. Of course, people may just decide to stay there a lot longer once they find a parking space. Uh, I've heard a lot of kids and teenagers, they don't want to ride their bikes to the library because there's been a lot of bicycle thefts there. So I think may, perhaps the city could pay for the installation of secure bicycle parking with like lockers. And I, if we could complete the bike lanes and trails that go past the library, that would make parents more comfortable in allowing their children to ride their bikes to the library. And the last one is an issue of I've, one of my pet peeves at the library. A lot of the space inside is taken up by people getting paid to do tutoring. And I kind of think that's not an appropriate use of the library as a commercial enterprise. Uh, that's not really up to the city to do anything about. It would be up to the library district to decide if that's a situation that they would like to continue. So where would the money come from? Well, I'm not sure. Some general fund, we can finance it. And I think in a community as wealthy as Cupertino, we could find the money to build a program room. Next, I'll move on to resident engagement. We really need a platform where residents can communicate both with the city and with each other about important issues. For a while, we thought Nextdoor was going to be that solution, but it really has failed. They're, they censor, they kick people off who say things they don't like, and a lot of people are no longer even able to use it. So I'd like to find a non-commercial, non-profit option like OpenGov where we could use to communicate better with our residents. A lot of residents don't know all the services that the city can provide, provide to them because it's not communicated well. We have the monthly publication, Cupertino Scene, and I mean, that's about it. We, we used to have Cupertino Courier, but it's, it no longer provides any Cupertino-centric news. Now, Public Works. Is Roger Lee here today? Oh. So, we all drive on our roads. And who knows what PCI stands for? It's Pavement Condition Index. In Cupertino, our PCI has been really improving. We're now at 84 out of 100, which, which is actually stupendous. As interim city manager said to me, to get to 100, we'd have to have our roads like bowling alleys, that smooth. So if you ever drive across the border from Cupertino to San Jose, say on Blaney Avenue, you can immediately see the difference between Cupertino's roads and San Jose's roads. I think San Jose is somewhere in the 60s. Uh, and, and it does affect you. It, it affects how well your, how much maintenance you do on your car. And it's something that, that everyone sees every day is the condition of our roads. So I really appreciate our public works department stepping up on, in this area, which we all experience all the time. Next is our water system. I don't know how many people know, but Cupertino does own their own water system for part of the city out in Monta Vista, and it's leased out to San Jose Water. And what we've been doing recently, we've been doing an assessment of the value of that system and what kind of maintenance it needs in preparation for when the lease is up for renewal to make sure it's being maintained in the way that was promised. Our bicycle plan is moving forward, and the Unepero Serra and Regnar Creek Trail plans are in progress. And these will be a great way to try to reduce car traffic in some small way in our city if we can make people feel safe on their bicycles and walking. So here's my target. Cupertino's kind of been the target of some unfair publicity in the recent past. And we need to do a much better job of educating people and communicating the facts. And it's, it's really our fault when the public gets fake news and doesn't realize what's going on. So I mentioned before, we've entitled about 140% of our arena numbers. That's the regional hou housing needs allocation. Unfortunately, not a lot has been built, but we have done our part, complied with state law, and we've allocated this housing to developers that asked for it. We just don't have it built. And this is, I think I had this slide up here before. This is 
what we have at 1.35% under construction. Now we've been criticized a lot. They say, oh my gosh, Apple added 13,000 new jobs to Cupertino, where's all the housing? Uh, did anyone here work for HP when they were on that site? So it really wasn't an empty lot before Apple built their new campus. It was a campus, and I've heard estimates as high as 12,000 people and as low as 9,800 people that were on that site in the past. So all those people are gone. It's been replaced by new workers, but we didn't add 13,000 jobs. We probably added a couple of thousand because uh, new service workers there, but most of the workers came from other Apple locations into the new spaceship. So what we don't have in Cupertino, we don't have any lobbyists in, in Sacramento lobbying for our cause. I was talking to a San Jose city councilman last week. He says, what do you mean you don't have any lobbyists? We have two full-time lobbyists in Sacramento lobbying on behalf of San Jose. So at the last West Valley mayor's meeting, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, which West Valley comprises of Campbell, Los Gatos, Monte Serino, Cupertino, and Saratoga, we discussed if we could split a lobbyist among the cities to go up there and lobby for the small cities, which have really gotten short shrift from the state because San Jose gets all the attention and we're almost the poor stepchild. Now, when I was in Sacramento two weeks ago, some of us met with some of the assembly people and state senators, and one thing they said was, well, the California League of Cities doesn't have that much influence because the other lobbyists come, come to us with buckets of money for our reelection campaigns, but the League of Cities can't do that, and we can't do that either, but they do worry about votes. So if it's clear what the residents want, what the voters want, we do have some influence in Sacramento if we can get our message across. And there are several organizations recently formed. There's the Bay Area Leadership Council, the Nine County Coalition, and Livable California. And these are statewide and regional organizations that are lobbying for housing and transportation solutions. And these are not corporate lobby lobbying groups. These are comprised mainly of elected officials that are looking out for the best interests of their own cities. And one meeting I was at earlier this week, we were talking, how can we not have each city going off and doing their own business tax or head tax? We need to come up with a solution where one city adopts a business tax and the businesses run off to another city that doesn't have it. We need a regional approach in order to get the funding for the things we need. In terms of finances, we're still very financially stable. We're always concerned about our pension costs because the discount rate from CalPERS has been declining. Every time it declines, we have to kick in a big bucket of money to make up the difference. Um, the embezzlement case that many of you are familiar with, where a former city employee allegedly embezzled money from the city, that's moving forward. I think it, in March it will go um, is the next trial date or the next date when something happens with that. Now that money was actually money that was given as deposits for projects, we believe. And when that happens, the city draws against it for inspections and permits. And at the end, whatever money is left is supposed to go back to the person that made the deposit. And that didn't happen. That's the money we believe was taken. So unfortunately, if we do get restitution, from the alleged person that did this, the money will not be Cupertino's. It will probably have to go back to the state of California and then hopefully back to the people whose deposits it was. Um, we do have capital expenditures coming up. Uh, the city hall needs to be either renovated or replaced, which is um, between 30 and $70 million. There's a lot of other obsolete buildings in the city that don't meet earthquake standards or ADA standards, and we are gonna have to move forward and find the money uh, to make those changes. And uh, like I said before, we're moving forward with some groups like the Bay Area Leadership Group to develop business tax proposals. And these will be modeled on Mountain View, East Palo Alto, and San Francisco. I already talked about the embezzlement, and now another subject near and dear to many people is 
uh, the Lehigh Cement Plant. If you live in that area, you're aware of all the trucks constantly going up Foothill Boulevard between Lehigh Cement and the Stevens Creek Quarry. So the city, we are looking into what can be done about this traffic. But what we don't want to do, we don't want to do the wrong thing. The illegal road that they built inside, if we make that legal, that's not the right approach. We need to find a solution that solves this problem long term. And we are looking in to things I can't talk too much about here in ways to, uh, to solve this problem. Now, the park's master plan um, has been reviewed recently. There's been a couple of public meetings. There's actually very poor turnout at these meetings. Uh, I've looked at the master plan. I think it needs additional work. There's a lot of residents that have questioned some of the expenditures uh, suggested in that plan. But that, that's just a plan that's looking at options. There's nothing concrete about are we really going to spend $100 million on a performing arts center? None of that's really determined yet. And the other thing we're, we want to look into is an ordinance that says where parkland actually needs to be. I was surprised talking to one legal counsel. I said, well, you know, can park, doesn't parkland have to be on the ground? And she said, no, it could, you know, it could be in the sky, it could be underwater you don't have an ordinance that says where it needs to be. So that's something we should look into because personally, I'm a firm believer in parks on the ground. Now, I was in the hospital a few months ago and as they're wheeling me into surgery, the person pushing the gurney says, so what's happening with Valco? <laughs> <laughs> that person ended up in the emergency room after that. So here's a picture of Valco back in the heyday. You can see all the stores, the parking lot where Rose Bowl used to be. And the answer I have, what's happening is we don't really know because depending on the outcome of the Valco litigation and other challenges, there are several options that the property owner could move forward with. They could build, move forward with the SB35 plan that they submitted and that was approved by the city. Um, they could build the tier two plan that the previous council approved if the ordinances and resolutions are upheld by voters, or they could come forward with a new specific plan if the ordinances and resolutions are rejected by voters or rescinded by the city council. So I don't have a good answer of what's gonna happen here. Uh, you know, a lot depends on the legal issues and what the property owner decides that they wanna do going forward. Now, personally, I would love to see a new specific plan uh, that we could have the community be engaged in creating and then we could come to an agreement that everyone would have to give up a little, but everyone would get some of what they wanted. I don't know if that can happen, but that would be my ultimate goal. And here's my headstone, 1956 to 2056. <laughs> What's happening with Valco? People from other countries ask me this. It's like, now, our city attorney, um, we've decided to contract out with Shoot Mahali and Weinberger for city attorney services. So we will not have a city attorney directly hired by the city. It will all be contracted out. There's advantages to this approach. This firm has a lot of experience in issues that we currently contract out anyway, even with a city attorney. So this probably will cost us less than having our own city attorney and then still contracting out for various things because you get a much better per hour rate when you have a, have a setup like this. And a lot of smaller cities do this kind of thing. And we're still working with outside counsel on the situation regarding the former city attorney, Randy Hum. I don't really have any updates on that at this time. Now, I asked all the commissions to send me a few points on what, what's been happening, because our commissions, you know, they work basically for free. Uh, I think one, one commission does get paid per meeting. And there's, we just had our commission interviews on Monday and Tuesday. There's tremendous interest in these unpaid commission positions. People really want to give back to their city. We really need to respect the work that they do. 
So a bike ped, they put in the wayfinding signs you may see around the city. They've been helping design the class four bike lanes. They've been working on the Regnar Creek Trail study and they've been doing adult biking education classes. The Library Commission has partnered with Sustainability on a speaker series. They provide recommendations for the new patron survey and they spent a lot of time this year, last year, trying to keep their commission from being disappeared. <laughs> Public safety, they've done the PEP classes. Uh, they, they have public safety forums, presentation on domestic violence, and they also spent a lot of time trying to keep their commission from being disappeared. Fortunately, both commissions survived and are doing well. The planning commission has been, um, they recommended the 25 housing units at the Forum and a new healthcare facility. They held hearings on the Valco specific plan. They recommended tier one and a half and they recommended that we adopt uh, an ordinance regarding short-term rentals. Fine Arts had a volunteer fair. They've done outreach, they've done sculptures, they've done the utility box art that I'm sure you've all seen, and they've been given awards for various artists. Bo Bettino. Last year, Mayor Paul spent some of his discretionary money on Bo Bettino. Now, I don't know, I was looking into this and I saw this other slide about, it says, rethink your Asian drink. If you've ever looked at the amount of sugar in a, in a um, one serving of boba, it's pretty significant. I guess once a year, having our teens drink boba would, was fine, but we don't really want to promote unhealthy eating habits among our teens. This is a Fisher-Price toy. It's called Soul Crushing Meeting. <laughs> and I feel like the city council meetings have become soul crushing meetings. So how do we fix this? So I've talked to the city manager and I said, you know, we have to do something about these staff reports where, like I'm doing, it goes up on the screen a PowerPoint and every line is read to the public that could just as easily read it. We probably need to figure out how to do better with oral communications so we don't have two hours of oral, oral communications before the rest of the meeting. And our council reports, by the time we get to council reports, which I think are really important, they say what we've been doing for the past two weeks, by that time it could be two in the morning. And a lot of us say, oh, I'll just forget it. I just, I'll just pass on my council report this week. You know, it's 2 a.m., everybody wants to go home. So I really would like to move those council reports to the beginning of the meeting, right after oral communications, so the people that come to the meetings and want to know what we've been doing in the past few weeks, they will have that opportunity and they may not be interested in the agenda items uh, that come after that. So I think it would be a good idea and at the, the League of Cities new mayor's meeting, this was suggested as a way to improve meetings. So I would like to try to adopt that if it's possible. So finally, the goals for 2019. I'd like to fix our general plan inconsistencies, address traffic issues. The sheriff deputy can issue like 10 times more tickets. That would be great, uh, especially if they're driving in from Saratoga. <laughs> in a Tesla with no front license plates. So we need to plan our capital expenditures coming forward. Um, we need to finish the park master plan. Uh, the code of ethics, it was kind of hastily adopted and then removed, and we will be bringing that back very soon. It was just not really ready for prime time and should not have gone forward. But we, have, we did survive in Cupertino for 50 years without the code of ethics. I think we'll survive for another month or so until we can bring it back to the council. Uh, the ELI housing units, I hope we can work with nonprofits, philanthropic organizations to get those units going. And then finally, we want to work with the regional and state organizations that I mentioned to promote local control, especially in light of CASA and what's coming down the pike with SB 50. And um, basically, Sacramento is looking at these smaller cities as a way to ext extract money out of 
because they've been irresponsible in how they've been allocating funds and the larger cities as well are not financially st as stable as a lot of these smaller cities. So I think that's all I have. So I thank you for your time. Sorry if I went on too long. Thank <clears throat> you.